I don't know if you've noticed, but I'm not Andre. No. But we do have things in common. I know Andre loves it when you guys sing back. And, and that's what I'm here to do. I'm here to see you sing. And I will try to lead you. So let's stand, let's sing number 727. We're going to sing, sing our man, our man. You don't have songs, but that's okay. You guys know the rest of these songs. Sing. Our man, our man, we go. Our man, our man. Glory be to God. Our man, our man. Thank you. 
And God, I pray that there will be no distractions. Pray that everything that we do is a fragrant offering. Bless this time, bless our service, bless the worship, everything. Uh, God, have our travel steer and back. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Go ahead and stand with me, please. We'll continue to sing. sing coming up, Lord. Now, if you know, I sing these songs a little bit different than you guys do in Memphis, it's okay. Just try to come back, okay? <laughs> well, I'm coming up, Lord. And I'm coming up soon. Well, that's not all. 
talk about me. You can talk about me. Just as much as you please. Just as much as you please. You can talk about me. You can talk about me. Just as much as you please. You can talk about me. Just as much as you please. I talk about you. Girl, on my knees. And all my sins are washed away. I've been to me. But I've been to me. Because 
it relates to our belief because he he is finding they're finding well he said that they believe they've only found one one percent of all of the archaeological artifacts of you know our Christian faith like for example he gets in debates Mr. Kramer he gets in debates with people over whether God is real or whether faith is real and one of his uh, one of his arguments is they found. Um, what's the wall? Mickey, what's the wall? Jericho. He found them. They found the wall of Jericho. They found it. They unearthed it. Wow. Man, the, the non believers, it's just a wall to them. But him, as a Christian uh, archaeologist, he he knows what that means. What He knows the story of Jericho and why the wall is laid down. So, anyway, uh, and also. That relates to crucifixion. Does it really happen? Mm -hmm. You know, it happened. Yeah. But in in the research, you know, we can just go and run with what I, what happened because what we're told, and then you start finding artifacts. And this is another archaeological find. So maybe in my future I'll become an archaeologist. Mm -hmm. Because I, <laughs> I am pretty confident with that. But um, they found in 1980 uh, that. They, they found some some archaeological findings of a tomb of someone who's crucified. And you know, you always think of the hands and the ankles. And I mean, you have to have a nail this long to go through the ankles. That's what I'm saying. And we're not talking, you know, pain. So, the, the thing that, and I don't know, this is one too. And they're saying that he was there, not sure that they were hung like this, and that they were on each side of the, the beam instead of on the front, all contorted with pain and pain, but they would go through the heel. And so they were on each side. So, and I didn't realize, do you know how how he died on the cross? Mm -hmm. I mean, how did he die? Okay. But it's because of the fluids in his lung, like, like uh, uh, what is it called? Pneumonia. <laughs> but but they are saying that hypothetical is that he, he suffocated, which means it was even worse. Which I guess it was suffocation either way. But for six hours he was on that cross for us. So just some thoughts. The nails are hammered through his legs and his wrists, or hung on the cross, however it was. And tell you the truth, I don't want to think about it. It's easier to think. Like the Bible says, it's crucified, move on. But when we realize the pains that he went through, mm -hmm. it makes us free. Yeah. So he was hung with the weight of his body on, on the nails for six hours. We talked about that. Mm -hmm. And most of us here, uh, except for maybe mothers, have actually gone through some long term pain. You know, mm -hmm. men won't be able to live, of course. Mm -hmm. We, we don't have any idea of pain in general. A few, a few minutes of, of uh, or hours of pain, and we're getting prescribed drugs and going to the, to the drugstore. You know, I mean it's true. And so my point today is communion, gratitude to Jesus for the most incredible gift of salvation from death, right. and hopefully uh, to be encouraged to what. Just the others receive it as well. Amen. Okay. All right. We'll read this and we'll, we'll pray. And I'm at Matthew uh, 26, 26. <coughs> and while they were eating, Jesus took some bread, and after blessing, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take ye, this is my body. And when he had taken the cup and given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for me, for forgiveness of sins. But I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. All right, let's pray. Thank you, Father God, for uh, your Bible that gives us the truth and uh, uh, the living uh, the living and active, like you tell us in Hebrews. And, and uh, well, we thank you for your Son, Jesus Christ, and the freedom we had, and help us to... Uh, to remember to rekindle uh, the gratitude of, of what it is to be to be saved, and to remember the pain that that uh, 
that Jesus went through for us and and the example for us we can live here on this earth until we do see him doing kingdom. And I pray for this bread and this wine that as we remember in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 We will glorify the King of Kings. We will glorify the Lamb. We will glorify the Lord of Lords, who is a great I am. Hallelujah to the King of Kings. Jesus. 
The kingdom is bigger than you. Amen. Okay. Amen. The kingdom is bigger than you. Amen. For the past several months, Steve has been leading our church through an in-depth look at what it means to be a part of the kingdom of God. This lesson is related to this theme, however it stands independently on its own. The goal of our study this morning is to expand our perspectives beyond ourselves, to walk circumspectly, as uh, the King James Version puts it in Ephesians 5, 15. So other translations might say, walk accordingly, walk carefully, walk cautiously. Uh, but the idea is that we must live wisely, redeeming the times, because the days are evil. Rather than having a traditional sermon of three points in prayer, I want us to go on a journey from a narrow perspective of the world to a broader, more circumspect perspective, a view of what it means to be a disciple living in the kingdom of God from a higher view. Our lesson today will take us on a journey from fundamentalism to freedom of Christ, from legalism to love, and from wrath to relationships. It will be part biblical reflection, part personal testimony, and part reflection on how God seeks to transform us through our experiences. I'll wrap it up today with three action items, things that we can do to help broaden our scope of God's kingdom. But before we begin, let's go to God in prayer. Amen. Lord God, we are so thankful for this opportunity to call you our Father. As our brother Mark said, you are our Father, not our grandfather, not our uncle, you are our Father. And we're thankful for the relationship we have with you and we have with other children of God, Lord. Lord, your children don't all look the same. They don't all think the same. They don't all act the same, but we're all your children, Lord, and we're all in relationship with you because of who you are and what you've done through your Son, Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray that this morning you fill us with your spirit, fill us with wisdom and discernment. Lord, fill us with humility and understanding. Lord, I'm thankful that I have the opportunity to speak here. I pray that you use me as an instrument for peace. He is a, as, as, as an instrument of helping us as we go along this journey, Lord, understanding that you were with us along the journey. That, Lord, in order to be built up in your image, we all have to be broken down. We have to be humble. We have to go through experiences in life that change and shape our thinking so that we become more and more uh, looking like you, looking, bearing your image here in the world. Bless us in our study this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 I want to start off by sharing a little bit more about with my own story. I grew up in a church bubble. My earliest memory about God. Most of the people I worshipped with on Sunday looked and thought like me. They were the same skin color as me. They had the same politics as my family had. Uh, we lived in the same neighborhoods and had similar socioeconomic backgrounds. Likewise, I went to a Christian school where all the faculty and staff were also part of the same church fellowship as me. So I didn't see my teachers not just Monday through Friday, but I saw them on Sunday mm -hmm. as well. That was also an interesting experience depending on how the week went. <laughs> <laughs> At church, I listened to sermons about how we in our church were the one true church. Mm -hmm. Does that ring a bell? Yes. Those of you who have been disciples for a long time, you know that terminology. Not only did we restore the New Testament church, but we were taught that the church and the kingdom of God were one and the same. Anyone who was not in the church of Christ was not a part of the kingdom of God and was lost. Furthermore, we often look down on other congregations within our own fellowship who did the church differently than we did. We call them liberals. We call them Pentecostals if they worshiped differently than our church. Sound doctrine was a checklist of issues. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. It was a checklist of issues which demanded uniformity in order to maintain unity and the right hand of fellowship. Our call as a child in elementary school getting into arguments with other students, uh, pleading with them to join our church because we were right and everyone else was wrong. In order to remain faithful and obtain salvation, we had to follow the clear pattern set forth in the New Testament of the early church. Anything else would put our souls at risk. In spite of all this, I learned to love God and became a disciple as a young man, being baptized in Christ for the forgiveness of my sins and being added to the church. Acts 2.38 
was my green purse. It was my call and cry. When we first become disciples, we often start off in a state of immaturity. But as we grow in Christ, our knowledge and understanding grow as well. God does not pull us out of the world, but he expects us to remain in the world as right. people who exert spiritual influence and who mirror the image of God to those around us. Right. We live in a world that is becoming increasingly polarized and troublesome. And in times like this, where Christians can shine their light and brightest when we allow God's spirit to dwell in us and transform people around us. In order to transform the world, we ourselves must first be transformed by the renewing of our mind, as mentioned in Romans 12, verse 2. Right. This begs the question, what about our worldview needs to be renewed? Mm -hmm. Come on. Renewal is a process, not an event. Mm -hmm. When Peter left his fishing boat to follow Jesus, it took him a while before he matured to the point where God could use him. Even after following Jesus for three years, we see throughout the gospel his immaturity and lack of understanding, culminating in his denial of Jesus, not once, but three times. Mm -hmm. After the resurrection, we see Peter acting differently, taking the heart of Jesus' commands to feed my sheep. By delivering a sermon on Pentecost in Acts 2, that would become the kickstart of the early church. While Peter preached mostly to his own people who had been absorbed into the diaspora in Acts 2, it isn't until his vision in Acts 10, which, where he's called to go and deal with Cornelius, the first Gentile convert. Mm -hmm. He's gone, he's motivated to go. God reached out to this person who's not a Jew, not like him. In his testimony that he gives to the church in Acts 11, Peter notes that the Spirit not only told him to not discriminate against the Gentiles, right. but asserted that these outsiders also received the gift of the Holy Spirit just like he did. Yeah. Peter then asked a rhetorical question left his audience stunned in Acts 11, verse 17. If then God gave them the same gift, reading from the NSO, NRSV, if God then gave them the same gift that he gave us when we believe in Jesus, who was I that I could hinder God? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Preach. Come on. Right. The truth is that God is not hindered by our prejudices and limited perspectives. Right. Most of us, at one point or another, are guilty of putting God into a box thinking that God has limits and boundaries which are similar to our own. The reality is that God shows no partiality, Romans 2.11. While we tend to think of the world in binaries of good and evil, us versus them, right versus wrong, black and white, Democrat versus Republican, right? Mm -hmm. uh, the reality is that not everything is that clear. Right. There's often a lot of gray area in between. Is there not? Yeah. Mm -hmm. The reality of the world is so much more complicated. At some point, our bubbles get burst. For me, it was in 2001 when I saw how Christians reacted in the wake of the September 11th terrorist attacks with anger and hatred toward a foreign enemy. I was told that the enemy hated our freedoms and our way of life. I began to ask the question, then, who is my enemy? Doesn't Jesus call us to love our enemies? Isn't that what I learned growing up in church? Right. I saw nothing but the opposite from the people in my church and school who vigorously tried to convince me that the enemies of the United States of America were also the enemies of God. Wow. Was this true? No. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Josiah, for answering the question. This might be rhetorical. We'll talk about what rhetorical means later. <laughs> Today, we see conflicts in the world, and we are pushed to pick size. Right now, it's Israel versus Palestine, and Ukraine versus Russia. The past has been the USA versus Russia. Reality is that there are Christians on all sides of this conflict. Which side should we be praying for? Hmm? Paul commanded Timothy in 1 Timothy 2, verses 1 through 2, that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for everyone. Yeah. For kings yeah. and all who are in high positions, so that we may lead a quiet life and peaceful life in all godliness and dignity. Mm -hmm. 
He goes on in verse 4 to say that God desires everyone to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. Do we pray for our leaders, even if we disagree with them? Do we pray for Vladimir Putin of Russia, for Benjamin Netanyahu of Israel, even Kim Jong-un of North Korea? Do we pray for Christians in these countries as well? When Nelson Mandela was asked why he didn't outright condemn certain people who were enemies of the Western world, he replied, one of the mistakes which some people make is to think that their enemies should be our enemies. Indeed, one of the biggest ways in which Satan deceives us is to make us think that our enemies are either individuals or groups of people. Right. Us versus them. In reality, our enemy is Satan himself. Right. Right. In the famous Armor of God passage in Ephesians 6, we're reminded in verse 12 that our struggle is not against enemies of blood and flesh, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of the present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. And it's no, 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 it's no, it's no joke that when, when Paul lists out these weapons of warfare, these are not carnal weapons, but ways we can defend ourselves and attack these enemies with truth, with righteousness, with the gospel of peace, with faith, and with God's word. Just a few years later, after this bubble of mine was burst, a new family moved to our church my senior year of high school. They had been missionaries in Tanzania, a country in eastern Africa, which at the time I had never heard of, nor could I even locate on a map. These stories and experiences there inspired me to not only become a missionary, but also to travel there specifically and do ministry. I'll never forget taking that long flight from the Memphis airport. And I felt like I had arrived on a different planet. Maybe even in the land of the lost. You remember that old show where they kind of drive off and boom, they just appear, you know, and go down the river. It felt like that. Like, where was I? What was I doing? <laughs> For once, I was a, the minority who was expected to conform to a different set of expectations completely foreign to my own. During my time there, I learned that the issues that I had grown up facing as, as an American were not necessarily what the Tanzanians were thinking about or concerned about. While I was wrestling with issues like dating and finding my future partner, they were wrestling with issues like polygamy. The questions that they were asking about the scriptures were completely different than the ones I've heard in Sunday school. What was normal to me was odd to them, and vice versa. In a nation where poverty and unemployment were high, there were greater concerns about survival and fewer concerns about minutia and luxuries which the churches there had little time to argue over. My time living and working in East Africa has forever changed and shaped my perceptions of the world. I came from an environment that valued independence, autonomy, and individual freedom, and encountered a flavor of Christianity which stressed interdependence, consensus, and submission to the greater good of community over, over individual wants and needs. I initially went there thinking that I was trying to be the one giving out all the blessings of knowledge and resources, but was humbled by the generosity and wisdom of those who possessed very little. I came with, frankly, what they call the life savior complex, thinking that I was there to redeem them, when in reality it was these people who were much richer in faith than myself that redeemed me. Over the past 15 years, I've been involved in ministry. Uh, I've been on a journey where God continues to transform me more and more into his image and likeness. He does so by humble. Amen. He does so by making me humble. I began my ministry as a Pharisee, much like Paul, and that I cheered on those who were tearing others down. And I gradually opened up to see that God's work in the world is beyond who I am and where I worship. I am reminded of the time when John approached Jesus in Mark 9, verses 38 through 40. The same story is also in Luke chapter 9, verses 49 through 50. Same teacher, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we tried to stop him because he was not following us. Do you remember what Jesus said there? Do you remember what Jesus said? He said, do not stop them. Do not stop them. 
for the one who doesn't need a power in my name will soon be able to speak evil. So, so it says this, whoever is not against us is for us. Don't hinder them. Don't stop them. Yeah. Just because God is working beyond you doesn't mean you should hinder us. Right. Right. Sometimes it takes these humbling experiences for us to see that God's work goes beyond our clique, yeah. our circle, yeah. or even our church. Amen. Yes. Growing up, I had read books and listened to lectures about dangerous movements within the churches of Christ. Mm. One of them being the Boston and the Crossroads movement. Yes. Mm. Uh, the cycling movement, I was, was known even earlier. What did they say people? <laughs> I had been told of the horrors of, of control and spiritual abuse, despite having never met anyone associated with the fellowship. However, when I moved to Memphis for seminary, I met several ministers from the ICOC churches of Chicago who were studying there alongside me. And I was blown away with their zeal and their knowledge and their humility. They openly discussed the struggles which had impacted the church, along with the collective repentance and desire to, to continue to improve and grow. Yeah. Since joining the Memphis church, I've sat down with disciples from across the ICOC and again, seen that same zeal, knowledge, and humility. I've heard about stories from the past, mainly the Henry Creed letter. Everyone reads up the Henry Creed letter. This is not here to heal and grow from past mistakes. Wherever I visited the church in other areas like Little Rock, Nashville, uh, even in Kenya, I've been greeted with the warmth and the hospitality, which I rarely experienced during my time in mainline churches of Christ, for which I've been very grateful. At the same time, I've come to realize that the family of God is bigger than my friends, my family, my clan, in my tribe. The kingdom of God is bigger than my ethnicity, my nation, or my allies. Israel thought that it was only God's people when in reality God had called them to be a priestly nation and a holy people to draw others back to God. They weren't the only people of God. They were chosen by God with the full mission to bring others back to Him. Likewise, we as a church are called to do the same. Be light and life in a dark world. There is no room for fundamentalism among the society of Christ. Let me repeat that. There is no room for fundamentalism, that is, seeing the world from a singular, narrow point of view, without consideration of other perspectives. Right. Uh, there's no room for that type of attitude among the society of Christ. We must be willing to listen, to be challenged, and to be humbled by God, and the people who he places in our life to point us toward him. So how do we broaden our perspective of God's kingdom? As I mentioned in the beginning, I have three action items that I would like for us to consider today. These are things that we can all do to help challenge ourselves, not only to deeper faith, but to a broader understanding of what God is doing in the world. The first action item is this. Spend time developing relationships with people who don't look or think like you. Right. right. We all have people in our cities and neighborhoods who are different from us. Whether you live in a big city like Memphis or Little Rock, or you live in a small town where most people share similar values, there are always people around us who are different. Whether it's your local ethnic food restaurant, your favorite salon, a local gas station, or a motel. There are people all around us who are different from us. Different ethnicities, different religions, different backgrounds, different experiences. Whom we can encounter. Even within our diverse fellowship, we have so much diversity that we often don't have to go too far to encounter someone different. I love that thing that's part about our fellowship, that we have such a diversity across the board. Mm. For those who are interested in podcasts, one I can recommend, which is connected with our movement, is the Common, Common Grounds Unity Podcast. It features different people from the Restoration Movement who talk about ministries they do. By the way, I was listening recently. They said there are 32 different strengths of the Restoration Movement. Wow. 32. That's not just the Churches of Christ or different varieties of Churches of Christ, the ICOC, Christian Churches, Disciples of Christ, and others. What's the name of the podcast? Common Grounds Unity Podcast. Common Grounds Unity Podcast. Common Grounds Unity Podcast. Wherever you listen to podcasts, iTunes, Spotify, whatever it is, wherever good podcasters are put up. Mm hmm. And it features different people across the streams talking about what they do. So I said, wait. My kids want to be on YouTube, by the way. That's how she's coming out. 
<laughs> they don't want to be on TV, as I said. Uh, what they recommend in the podcast is this. This is their mantra. Getting together with others who are different and initially finding common ground rather than focusing on differences. Whether it's someone in another background altogether, we all have people with whom we can be and die along. The point is spend time developing relationships with people who don't look and think like you. The second action item is connect with another church from our fellowship in another country. One of the things I enjoy the most about being a part of our fellowship is its international flavor. So we can go on Disciples today and I guess I that's I want to come to. Hope you don't mind them standing up here. <laughs> and going on Disciples today and seeing that we have churches located all across the world in almost every country. Amen? Amen. Amen. Most of our churches have websites where we can learn more about the ministers and ministries which these churches do, along with contact info, where we can learn more about what they're doing. Many of our churches have worship services online and hold midweek services on Zoom. My experience in contacting churches in other countries has been one where I am greeted personally with interest and desire to share more about God's work in the context. I guarantee if you do the same, you contact these people, they will love to tell you more about what God's doing yeah. in their part of the world. I recently had an opportunity to travel to Kenya, connect with fellow disciples, from uh, the ICOC in Eastern Africa. The church in Nairobi has over 2,000 members. They serve as a sending church for not only the entire country, but for six other nations in the East African region. It was neat having a chance to fellowship in the homes of Kenyan church leaders who I never met before. I just called them and said, hey, I'm coming to your town. And they welcomed me in their home, they fed me, they broke bread together, and we really enjoyed the fellowship. It was me hearing about how God's working in that context and the challenges we're facing that might be a little bit different than what we face in the United States. There, recently in Kenya, there's been a renewed focus on evangelism and church planning. And it was encouraging to hear about the new congregations and Bible talks going on across the country. Even though I'm back here, I continue to participate when I can in the midweek Zoom services. There's a nine time zone difference, so when they're meeting at 7 on Wednesday, it's usually 10 a.m. our time, uh, depending on which time of the year. But uh, I've been really encouraged by those interactions, and uh, I continue to be a part of that. Also, I've joined uh, WhatsApp groups. If you're going to have any international friends, download WhatsApp Messenger. It's the most commonly used uh, message uh, program in the world. And uh, they have groups where they share devotional thoughts and encourage each other and what's going on. Uh, there's different opportun there's different opportunities to get involved with other churches in other parts of the world if you so desire. So, connecting with someone who doesn't look or think like you, connecting with a church and our fellowship in a different country. And the third one I want to suggest is this. Go on a mission trip. A great way to see God at work in the world is to go and do ministry beyond your comfort zone, either in another part of the country or even in another country altogether. Right. It's great that our churches support various missions, societies, and organizations like Hope Worldwide, did you know that these organizations also sponsor mission trips? Yeah. Huh? yeah. In 2024, I looked at Pope's website. They will have trips across the world in the United States, various locations there, Canada, Mexico, Nepal, Botswana, Ecuador, Bolivia, South Africa, Papua New Guinea, and the Philippines. I'm sure there's even more that they'll have along the way. Many of our sister churches in other cities also do annual mission trips to nurture relationships with the churches whom they support. Domestically or internationally, there are so many opportunities to go on mission with God and to broaden our perspectives to where we can see just how big God's kingdom really is. Amen. In Genesis 12, we read about the story of Abraham, where Abraham called God. God called Abraham out of her into a land that he had promised him. Do you remember how old Abraham was? Yeah. Like 600? Not 600. 100. But he was, he, was, uh, he was in the 70s, right? Yeah. Uh, not, 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 he wasn't 100. But not only that, he took his dad with him. Did you see that? Tara, Tara, however you want to pronounce his name. He took his dad. Imagine what, where we would be today if Abram, Abraham never left Earth. God had called him to be a blessing to the nations. 
even at an old age. So for those of you who say you're too old, there's no excuse. Amen. Those of you who can, who are able to, you don't have to go leave the country. The mission field is all around us. Uh, and there's often, but I want to specifically encourage you to go somewhere that's different. It can be California for those of you who are from the Mid-South, or the, or the Pacific Northwest. It can be South Florida, where we live, which is a, which is a state all to its own. There's places, yeah, it's where he was born, that's for sure. It can be the Northeast, there's me. And there's all kinds of places we can go and serve the Lord. So what are the three action items? Do people remember? Does anyone remember? What's the first one? Spend time with loving relationships. Yeah, spend some time with someone who's not like you. The second one? Yeah. Connect to another church in Africa. Connect to another church in the third one. Go on to Jesus. Exactly, exactly. I'm thankful to have been able to speak to you this morning. I'm thankful for the connection and the relationship we have in Christ. And God willing, the next time we come together, I want to hear about how you guys have acted on these things and how God continues to work in your lives. May God grant you with grace and peace and mercy. God bless you all. Amen. Thank you, Joseph, Zoe, Josiah. Uh, <laughs> My name is Tom Law from the Memphis Church, same local fellowship that we're grateful to <laughs> Joseph and his family in. So, in a moment, we'll dismiss. I want to thank Joseph yeah, for yeah. edifying us. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And I hope you've been edified, yeah. both from his personal testimony as well as his sharing with his most recent experience. We got to see the seventh generation of that lineage of the Lord. This is God allowing us to see the Bible fleshed out. I look out over here, and I see Steve and his two, his three children. I see more children back here passing on what God's given to us. Amen. Some of the things that stood out to me from message that God put on Joseph's heart to deliver to us is don't limit God to how we see ourselves. Some of the things that Joseph shared may not resonate for those who may not have been in the Church of Christ, the ICLC, or a Christian environment. For folks like me who have, and we can picture we can relate to that concept of, hey, we're, we have it on straight. We're the one true church and the pride that takes over, both the institutional pride and more personal or individual pride to look down on others and think that we have it on straight. So I thank Joseph for saying some hard things. And I hope that those of us who have ears to listen will hear and apply that there is no room for fundamentalism at its core to have this one way of belief. And we've got it straight and we know what's best for everyone else. I really appreciate the charge that Joseph gave to us to get to know others who aren't like us. And I would extend that a little bit, just to get to know others that we don't really know within our own local fellowship. One of the blessings that in the Memphis Church, we've had some new members that come from different backgrounds, and it gives me the opportunity to get to know my newer brothers and sisters better. Also, it makes me think about who among my long time Brothers and sisters I've known in the Memphis church that I haven't talked to in a while. Mm -hmm. And that idea of curiosity, a desire to build. I would encourage everyone as to apply the charge that Joseph gave to us and to be patient. To be patient when you do it. Because when you're building relationships with one another. It takes patience, it takes time, it takes intentionality. You have to give back. Someone approaches you, you got to want 
to get back in that relationship. Right. And if you make that intentional and you reciprocate, great. But it's like Joseph said, with renewal, it's not an event, it's a process. So building a relationship is just not a one-time event. It's a process. Mm -hmm. It takes time. And that's where the rubber meets the road. As long as I've been a follower of Christ, that's one thing that I've embraced, and I'm working on getting better. It's just mm -hmm. a process. You keep working at it by the grace of God. The Memphis Church and the Natural State Church in Little Rock have been meeting quarterly here in Brinkley for two years now. So this is our last quarterly meeting, and it's been since January or the first quarter of 2022. So that's an example of the building with each other, getting to know each other. Those who don't, you don't know yet, may not look like you, may not think like you. And it's been a wonderful process to get to know my brothers and sisters in the Natural State Church. I super appreciate the effort God made and from the Methodist Church to come and drive and meet the Brinkley. And then from that, build on it, keep it going. So I'm not sure for 2024 what the schedule is. As soon as Steve tells me, I'll pass it out. <laughs> But whether it is a structure, a process, it's on us. Make the most of it. And I really encourage you to do that. So one way we can do that now, after we dismiss is, if you can, stay for lunch. Break bread. And let's continue to practice what we see in the Bible. They worship, and they got together, and they broke bread, and they had fellowship with each other. Another way of building deeper. Yeah. I hope that everyone has a great Thanksgiving with your loved one, a great rest of the year. I will pray, and then our amazing worship leaders, Mark and Malika, will close us out with the final song. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much that you're so perfect, and so good, and so patient. And even though you're infinitely bigger, better, smarter, greater than us, yes. you care about us. Yes. And you give us time to learn things over and over again. And you humble us and you give us forbearance so that we can repent, we can renew, and we can grow and mature. Help us to face the challenges of this world, first and foremost, recognizing the ultimate enemy is Satan, and to apply what Joseph reminded us from scripture, that we do the imagery of uh, the armor of God, and how to fight back spiritually. And Father, please bless these individual relationships that we're building within our respective local church and across churches and around the world. Help us to be curious, help us to initiate, help us to reciprocate, walk with us, Father. For those of us who can stay and break bread together, we ask that you bless the food, bless the fellowship. To you be the Lord, in Christ Jesus' holy name is right. Amen. 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 Let's stand and we'll sing one last song. Yeah. We're going to sing a song. It's called See Kuiwana which means one of these days. So I'm going to go through the verses. I think you guys say this recently in Memphis, that's what I understand. So one of these days, see who we want. The verses are, one of these days, we will clap with them, which is pokatala. So the words in the book are, ina ita pokatala, ita pokatala, mamboko. So it'll be a call response, we'll just say it back when I say, so if I'm saying it wrong, you'll say it wrong. <laughs> we'll, all be, we'll all be good with that. But the verses are one of these days, the Lord's coming back. Won't that be a great day? Amen. We will clap with him. We will walk with him. We will follow him. We will walk with him. We will china china. We will dance with him. And it's okay. We're in church, but we know you can dance. So holy dance. And then finally, we will 
Yimbelalah, we will Hosanna, and we will praise him. So, I will start, I'll, I will say a verse, or I'll say a verse, and you'll echo it back. Okay? Ready? Oh, 